You may notice that I'm reading from a different Bible, a different translation. This was my grandfather's Bible, and it was the only possession of his that I wanted to keep. And um, I'm reading from Psalm 4. It is the King James, so if you're carrying something else, you'll, you'll notice there is a difference. But I can assure you they're translations from the same Hebrew words. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? But now that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself, the Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, Lift thy up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thy Lord only makest me dwell in safety. Amen. I've been reading the Psalms for years, and um, I have to say that many of them, if not all of them, are words from God. They're words from God to God, and they're about God. And many of them, in fact, all of them are inspired uh, songs, but many of them are uh, nothing but prayers. And when you read the Psalms, what we're getting actually is a little window into David's prayer life, which we can listen in on while he prays. And that's Wonderfully refreshing and very helpful. Now, in verse 1, you'll notice that we find David in distress. But then when we go to the last verse, verse 8, we find him in peace. Now, if David is telling the truth, and if this scripture is inspired by God, then we can be sure that somehow along the line, he's gone from distress to peace. Now, there must be good reason for that. In verses 2 to 11, I'm looking for the lessons that genuinely show how David went from distress to peace as he prays. Do you ever see yourself coming to pray and you're asking yourself, what good grounds or what good reasons do I have for prayer? It's not a bad question to ask yourself. Just look for a moment at verse 1. And the three first class grounds for prayer. David says, using the NIV, Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Now, when you're reading those words, and if you're reading them in, in the, uh, the Hebrew, you'll realize they're very forceful. Very forceful. They seem strong and adamant. And, and what that is simply is this. It is a passion-filled prayer. It is an urgent prayer. David is under stress. Now, I said to the folks on Wednesday night, have you noticed when you're under stress, you don't need to run to the bookstore and buy a book on how to pray? Somehow the urgency grips you and you don't need a book. You go straight to prayer. And David is under stress and he goes straight to prayer. And he cries out, O oh God of my righteousness. 
Now, right there and then, those are the first ground or the first good reasons for prayer. Because what David is saying is, I have a relationship with God. And that's the first good ground for prayer. And that's the first good reason for you and myself to pray. Because we have a relationship with God. But then, secondly, David gives another good reason. He says, you have given me room when I was in distress. And quite literally, in the original languages, we can uh, uh, spin that out as, I was squeezed in before, and you made room for me. I was stifled before, and you gave me breathing space. And so the second ground for prayer is David's testimony to what God has done in the past. The God who has delivered him from every trouble and trial and, and tribulation in the past is the God who stands with him now. And so he has first a relationship with God. And secondly, David has known God's help in the past. And the God who helped him in the past isn't going to desert him now. But then the third good reason and good ground for prayer is when we read those words of David, be merciful to me. Now you will have your own picture of God and you will have his attributes, the ones that you know, and that will definitely affect your view of God. But I love these words because what they tell us is that when we come to God we come to a God of mercy a God of grace the mercy that God has shown to individuals through time has been astounding think of the Ninevites when Jonah went to preach to them he was all upset because he wanted God to destroy them and they repented and of course God showed them mercy we need good reason to come to God in prayer. And we need to know that we've got good reason for coming. It will encourage us to come. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote a little pamphlet. It was more like a little booklet. And here's what he said. When we pray, we should have a whole quiver full of reasons hanging on our back. As we go to God in prayer, it's as if we're pulling out arrow after arrow of reasons why God should hear our prayer. Not for his sake, but for ours. And on Wednesday evenings, there are a good, faithful group who come to pray for Orangeburg Avenue Baptist Church and all that God has for us. And what we do there on Wednesday night is we're pulling out arrow after arrow and we're saying, please, for the sake of your name, for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your, your people, and we draw all these grounds of prayer to encourage our own hearts. And that's what David's doing. He's got three good reasons for his prayer. First, you are my God. I have a relationship with you. Second, you've helped me in the past. Thirdly, you're a merciful God of grace. So please, please hear my prayer. Now David's in distress and we can guess at it. And I'm not going to guess at it because I could be wrong. But he's in distress. And David speaks in verse 1. The distress that he's in is the kind of pressure you feel when you're hemmed in. It's a kind of general claustrophobia, and it takes many forms, and actually it affects all people, Christian and non-Christian. Now you'll remember, those of you who are students of the Lord Jesus, that in John's Gospel in chapter 16 and verse 33, he said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And those are very comforting verses. But the verse or the words before that were, in the world you will have tribulation 
or trouble. It's the same kind of word. It means to be squeezed. It means to be hemmed in. It means to be surrounded. And brothers and sisters, that's important for us because until you and I actually leave this world, we're going to be in situations where we feel squashed and we feel trapped and we feel outnumbered and we feel surrounded under great stress. That's just life. It's the same, believe it or not, for everyone. Now, it's very easy to talk about peace and to mouth the word and not be at peace at all. And I've got to admit, at times I've actually talked peace and yet I've radiated tension. But David genuinely, genuinely came to that place of peace, safety, and sleep. Now, I think it'll help if I'm a little bit more specific about David's distress. What was this pressure that he felt under? What was it that was squeezing him? And it's obvious from verse 2, he felt opposition from men. They did not give him the credit he deserved. They didn't acknowledge him as he really was, and he felt shamed by them. Well, in his prayer, in verses 2 to 7, he raises three things which have to do with these men. And it seems there were three very painful issues for David. And as David preaks to God, each one of those issues comes up in turn. And I suggest to you, in fact, I make a suggestion, but I'm sure of it myself, that each one of those issues is among the deepest longings that human beings feel. Yet each time one of these longing services, David raises an answer. The first human longing is for, listen, real honor. Real honor, real respect, real acknowledgement. And the question I ask myself in reading the psalm is, where do we find real honor? Verse 2, how long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? David had just listed his grounds for prayer, and now he launches right into his pain. He's suffering. He feels ashamed. He feels distressed. And I want to point this out to you very clearly. There's absolutely nothing in that verse that's got anything to do with God's honor. David isn't concerned about God's honor. He's concerned about his own. He says, it's my honor. There are some men who don't give David the respect that he's due. And you'll notice if you look at the last phrase in verse 2, these men seek after the wrong things. These men have got the wrong values, and therefore, you look at the first phrase in verse 2, and they've got the wrong estimations of people. In other words, David has been moving in company with people with different values, and so they see David differently. Their values, what they esteem, what they honor, is different from David and what he esteems and what he values and what he honors. And David wants them to see him as he sees himself, as he is in reality. And so in verse 3, David comes to a but. And in his, in his prayer, he says, by way of answer, know that the Lord has set me apart, the godly for himself. Now listen, and you must realize this or you'll get no worse. There's the key to real honor. Real honor in God's world is to be set apart by God. Real honor is to be chosen, or as the New Testament would have it, adopted. And so you see in verse 2, David feels dishonored by men. But in verse 3, he's honored by God. There's a difference. And notice also in verse 3, the Lord hears when David calls. In verse 2, these men have lots to say. They have lots of words, but they have no words for the Lord. 
Now, where do you find honor? Where do you find honor in this world? I think that's important because I believe honor is something that human beings deeply desire and long for. We want to be significant. We want to be respected. And the trouble is, that's very elusive. And we have to expend a great deal of energy chasing after those things. Whether it's in, a t in academics, getting to the top of your class. Whether it's in, in work or, or athletics or entertainment. These things are very, very elusive. And who actually gets this significance and respect and honor? And if you do get it, how do you keep it? How do you hold on to it? Now, there's honor in winning a gold medal at the Olympics, and I have never done that. Imagine standing on the winner's dais as your anthem is played and the crowd rise in ovation to your success. There's honor there. But it seems to me five or ten years later, we'll have difficulty remembering who won what where. And there's honor in climbing the ladder of success in business and in academics and in entertainment and fame. But the trouble is, it's very, very hard to hang on to. And even if you do receive honor from men, here's the terrible truth. We're fickle. And we soon stop honoring. We get tired of hearing your story. That great point that was scored. It was like a Hail Mary pass back then. And you've told the story thousands of times to thousands of people, but we get tired of hearing your story. And now we have moved on to someone else. So I ask, how do you find honor? How do you keep it? How do you find people to keep on giving it to you. It's very elusive. I wonder, is there honor apart from men's approval? And if you're a Christian, you'll say, of course there is. And if you look in verse 3, there's a very simple but profound view of honor. And it says that the beginning of honor is to be set apart by God. Now the truth is there's no greater honor in this world than to be set apart by God. There isn't anyone, not anyone in the universe who has greater honor than to be a Christian, to be set apart by God. That's the biggest thing. That's the greatest, highest honor ever. And in my experience of humanity, there are two things that are highly prized, significance and security. And both of those are found in a relationship, your relationship with God. And so real honor, according to verse 3, is to be found in being set apart for God himself. But then the second deep longing human beings seek is real hope. And I see that in verses 4 and 5. David says, In your anger, don't sin. When you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust the Lord. Now, I'm reading this verse many, many times. And I'm suggesting to you that David has gone to bed and immediately he's tempted as he prays to get angry, to get revenge. And I'm drawn to that conclusion because David is the one who was angry. Number two, he's the one who's lying on his bed and is told to be silent. And number three, he's the one who needs to trust in the Lord and rest his reputation and honor with him. Now I think of times when I've been lied about or slandered and I have to be truthful and say, my immediate reaction is to be angry. I know yours is different, of course. And I want to get hold of those people, and I want to give them what for. But here's the wonderful thing. Thankfully, as I lie torturing myself, the Spirit of God counsels me, and he bids me to be silent. 
He bids me not to strike out, but to trust the Lord. And just thinking of the words of God Almighty in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 15, you remember it? In quietness and trust is my strength. Real honor. Where do we find it? Verse 3, by being set apart to God. Real hope. Where do we find that? By trusting in the Lord. And now the third deep longing is what I call real happiness. And in these verses, David gives us the keys to real happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of a real relationship with God. And, and just to interject there, can I tell you, that's the main reason why a genuine backslider, and I use the term genuine backslider because there are people who call themselves backsliders and they've never been front sliders. <laughs> but the main reason a genuine backslider is more miserable than any other creature, look at verse 6 and 7. Real happiness is knowing the light of God's face shining upon us. It's knowing God's nearness to us. It's knowing his acceptance of it. It's knowing his pleasure with us. And the joy that God alone gives to us, filling our hearts. That's where real happiness comes from. When times are good for the pagans, pagans are happy. But whether times are good or bad for the believers, we will be happy, for we have the knowledge and the joy of God filling our hearts with whatever is needed. False happiness comes when there's plenty, when there's an abundant harvest of grain and new wine. But the joy of the believer comes not from outward material circumstances, but from the heart from the very fountain of God's Holy Spirit who lives within each of his people. And so by the time we get to verse 8, David is completely liberated from his own little dungeon and he's able to lie down. He doesn't have to toss and turn, thinking about himself and how he'll get revenge and put those men in their place. Because in his distress, through the pilgrimage of his prayer, he's come to peace. God's given peace. And he sleeps. And he sleeps because his honor and his reputation and his life is safe in God's hands. That's the journey. That's the journey. From distress to peace. It was the journey that David traveled. And it's the journey that we can travel. Remember that we have good reasons for prayer. Remember that God knows the deep longings of man's heart and God has provided for them. Remember, our peace doesn't come from material outward things. Our peace comes from our relationship with God. Knowing his mercy. Having his peace. Do you believe me? I believe it. And I'm not radiating tension. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It is a, a joy to us and it is instructive. And it helps us, Lord God, to know what to do. And it reassures us it's good for our heart, Lord, and really encourages us because we, like every other person, we are real human beings and we have longings and we have feelings. 
And even like non-Christian people, we face trials and tribulations and, and real pressures in this world. And we thank you, our God, that in the face of it all, we can know your peace and we can know that we are safe in your care and in your keeping. And that you are the sovereign God who is merciful to us. And Father, the good news is not only merciful to us, but you have got a heart full of mercy that you're willing to receive others who come to you through faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus. And that's our praise. You're our trust. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.